Hello and welcome to Just Jets episode number 237. What is going on? I am Matt O'Leary here to discuss with you why legacies are on the line in 2024. We have made it. It is the start of the 2024 NFL season. One of the more anticipated New York Jets seasons in their history. We will go through why this is such an important season for the New York Jets. And of course, get into your voicemails. Guys, thank you for hanging out with me in today's episode. As a reminder, Talking Jets is hosting a event for week four of the NFL season. We are in single digits for tickets. So if you're considering going, well, last call just about for Jets Broncos week four, pregame tailgate, ticket to the game, on the field after the game, an entry to win a jersey, all that and more, TalkingJets.com to pick up your tickets. Okay, we have done everything we could possibly do at this point from a fan perspective, from a content perspective. It is now time to officially get into 2024 where will we where we will be talking about NFL games this week that makes me so happy and so excited look the off season there are some fun things free agency the draft OTAs training camp but really the meat and potatoes of the NFL season is the games from September through the beginning of February and this year The New York Jets are hoping to be playing through February all the way to the bitter end. The issue? Well, I don't have to remind you. The New York Jets have the longest active playoff drought in all of the four major North American sports. NBA, NHL, MLB, and NFL. The New York Jets have the longest one of all those teams. Even longer than the Buffalo Sabres, who have uh, more recently made the playoffs in uh, in. Buffalo in what April of 2011 by a couple of months uh, the Jets have them beat by January of 2011 the last time they saw playoff action and last year was supposed to be the year that the streak finally came to an end unfortunately that hasn't been the case you know 2011 12 13 all the way through 2023 why because Aaron Rodgers unfortunately got hurt four plays into the season and missed the remainder of the year with a torn Achilles. All the hype, all the excitement about, justified by the way, I'm not blaming Jet fans for being excited about getting Aaron Rodgers after watching, we can go through the list of quarterbacks. We have all the time in the world to go through Zach Wilson, Trevor Simeon, Tim Boyle, Joe Flacco, Mike White, Sam Darnold, uh, Luke Falk, It goes on and on and on and on. Brooks Bollinger, you could go way back further. You know, the whole thing. A lot of awful quarterback play. The Jets get a first ballot Hall of Famer who is playing the position, who is trying to revitalize the team after, you know, they got off to a hot start in 2022 and then limped to the finish line because they got just absolutely dreadful quarterback play. They get a guy in here and Aaron Rodgers feels like the missing piece. All that swept away on the first drive of the season. Four plays into your season, and you're right back to where you started with Zach Wilson. Well, Zach Wilson's gone. Aaron Rodgers is back. And now the Jets have a better backup quarterback even in Tyrod Taylor. But really, the start with the legacy, this is the legacy episode. Legacies on the line is what I'm calling it. For Aaron Rodgers, he has a ton of pressure on him this year because he missed the the entirety of the 2023 season and many are asking what is he at this point in his career uh he was even banged up at times in 2022 and played through a what 12 games with a broken thumb and he wasn't phenomenal he wasn't you know his peak Aaron Rodgers but he had them right in playoff contention until the final game of the year um and as sad as it is His statistics in that 2022 season would rank him one of the best in New York Jets history if he put up those seasons in a green and white uniform instead of a green and yellow uniform. But he has a lot of people who are riding against him, people who are very critical of Aaron Rodgers. And I mean, look, like 
you might not agree with everything this guy says. I like, do I want to hear him go on a, a podcast and talk about, you know, his opinions on certain things? No, I want to watch him play quarterback. And I think that was the frustration that we got from him a year ago um, when unfortunately he wasn't playing due to the injury and he was still going on the shows and talking and it's like, that stuff was getting the off the field stuff was getting amplified, which was unfortunate because he doesn't get credit for, you know, rehabbing with the team and going to all these games and taking the pay cut to be a New York Jet last year. Instead, we focus on uh, the off the field negative with Aaron Rodgers and some of his opinions, which I don't agree with I don't think is the right way to go about it and from the Jets fan side of things like they're viewing him as the savior the the Jets uh, fans who believe they are going to be a Super Bowl team the reason behind that is because they finally have a quarterback that they believe in and it's up to him to prove that he's still that guy in 2020 and 2021 he played at an MVP level he was the most valuable player in the NFL in 20 and 2021 and 2022 hurts his thumb plays you know suffers through it and plays through it misses all of 23 what is he in 2024 his legacy is on the line does he want to come back and stink up the joint and look like you know washed Peyton Manning in his final year now Peyton that would go on the Broncos would go on and win a Super Bowl which I'm sure Rodgers would sign up for winning uh, winning a Super Bowl here but if for God, God forbid you know things go off the rails does Aaron Rodgers want his last memory in the NFL, what fans see as him washed up playing terrible for the New York Jets? No, he has way too much pride for that. Way too much pride for that. So he wants to prove everyone wrong. He wants to give the double bird to everyone who has called him out over the last year. And Rodgers has a mega, mega spotlight on him just because that's that's who he is and he always will. But he has a lot of people rooting for his downfall. And he has a ton of pressure to put up numbers from the media, from fans who are against him, and from Jet fans. Jet fans want to love the guy. I think a lot of Jet fans do. But he has a lot to live up to. Again, if he comes out and isn't very good and the Jets go 7-10 and 10 for the third year in a row... Well, <laughs> there's going to be some issues. There's certainly going to be some issues. So Aaron Rodgers is the first one that comes to mind. And then how do you not go to the GM and the coach? Joe Douglas, epic 2022 draft class. Absolutely epic. Uh, it landed star after star after star. He's built a strong roster. There's no denying it. There's This is a very, this on paper, this is a very good football team. Unfortunately, in the NFL, the games aren't played on paper they're played on the football field and it's time for him to win it's time for him to win he's 27 and 56 as gm of the new york jets now that record comes with some context because he took over didn't have the 2019 draft didn't have the 2019 free agency took over mccagnon's mess tore it down to the studs rebuilt it up in 2021 but with all of that, all of that in mind, I am telling you, like, there's context, and I like Joe Douglas. I think he has done a pretty good job with the New York Jets. I am not the the Jet fan that wants to give him a lifetime pass. I think too many people in this fan base are completely in and won over by Joe Douglas already, saying, like, he could do no wrong. Um there's no there's no more excuses like this is the year he has to win and if they don't win then he's going to be out of a job because I don't know how you can get a sixth draft and sixth free agency period with no playoff success or not even not even that just not making the playoffs the the leash would be incredibly long and again when he signed on here he signed to a six-year deal so he's entering like the end he he needs it's either it's put up or shut up time. Are you going to get the extension? Are you going to get a chance to be this team's general manager for maybe, you know, 10 years and build some playoff success? Or is this thing going to get torn down to the studs again if things go wrong this year? 
I don't think that's what's going to happen. Spoiler alert for tomorrow. I'm doing my full, you know, Jets and NFL preview tomorrow on the, you know, the day of the opening day on on Thursday. But like we got to we got to realize like it's time now. It can't be. Oh, well, it was a full moon and someone tripped over his shoelaces and the Jets went eight and nine and missed the playoffs. But hey, they improved by a game and they still have a really good core. So he's got to stay. There's no, no, no more of that. The context that is with his record, I'm not saying it goes out the window. That's not the right wording behind it. But his he's out of excuses is the main point. And there is immense immense pressure on Joe Douglas and the staff to finally get this team into the playoffs. I think I think they do it. I'm a believer in Joe Douglas, but it's not like again, a lifetime job Joe Douglas, you can't criticize how he's handled some circumstances. Not everything that Joe Douglas and the organization does is the correct way to go about it. Is the main point that I wanted to put out. It's not always that simple. Like you're allowed to criticize Douglas for how the Hassan Reddick situation has been handled or last year, not having a better contingency plan at some positions, you know, how long it's taken to build the offensive line. Um, still not, you know, being a playoff team, like all, all those are valid criticisms. The just and then on the flip side of the coin, like if you're just going to go, He's 27 and 56 and give no context to anything else and be like, the guy sucks. He should be fired. Like that's also ridiculous too. We got to have, we got to have a little bit of a brain here and admit that there is nuance to the conversation, but also realize that now 2024 is the time you don't see 2025. If you don't have the success in 2024. So you could preach this long-term vision that you may have. You're not going to see that long-term vision come to fruition if you don't start stacking some wins. And the same thing could be said with Robert Sala, right? That's the that's the big trio. Sure, there's talent, you know, the young talent that they drafted, but Rodgers as, as a face and Douglas as the GM and Robert Sala as the coach. And I think fans have turned on Robert Sala significantly quicker than they have on Joe Douglas. And I guess it's easy to turn on a head coach. He's the one who has to get up and speak to the media every single day. And he doesn't always do the best job of that. But for the Robert Sala fans, you could talk about that he's dealt with horrific quarterback play and a ton ton of adversity in his three years as head coach. And the team hasn't completely uh, quit on him. But same thing that I just went through with Joe Douglas. For Robert Sala, it is time to win football games. I can't hear about what quarterback situation there is, who quit or didn't quit on him, what, you know, whatever the case may be, how good the defense is. You can't ride the, he's a great defensive mind forever. He deserves a lot of credit for turning over this this defense so quickly. From, you know, worst, essentially the worst in the NFL in 2021 to one of the three best defenses in the sport over the last two seasons and what's likely to be a very good one yet again, maybe even an elite one in 2024, uh, assuming Hassan Reddick comes back at some point and, you know, the, the immense talent that they have there. He's proven that he is a very an elite defensive mind, elite D coordinator. Can he coach in this league? We still don't know. If you're definitive that he can't or that he can, I don't think that's fair yet. I don't think we've gotten enough information with the context that we've been giving over the given over the last three years to know one way or another. It seems like my assumption. Woody Johnson and ownership gave Douglas and Sala a pass for 2023 because the guy they brought in was done on the field four plays in. They're not getting that pass again. If Aaron Rodgers goes down, that's why they have Tyrod Taylor, who's started games in this league and played in a playoff game before, got a team to a playoff, granted a long time ago, but is one of the better backup quarterbacks in the sport. They needed a good plan. And it's time for Joe Douglas and Robert Sala to show that they are the guy. I think they can be, but once again, the theme of this episode or the theme of the monologue, at least in 2024, 
Legacies are on the line. Rodgers, Douglas, Sala, show me that you belong. I believe the Jets are a playoff team. I think they can make noise in the playoffs. This has been a year plus of, on paper, I think they should. It's time to be. The 2024 New York Jets, it is time. Let's get into voicemails. First up, we got Giancarlo calling in from Arizona, wants to talk. Alan Lazard. Hey, what's going on, Matt? Uh, it's Giancarlo from the Phoenix area out in Arizona, Former, formerly from the beautiful Hudson Valley. Uh, just wanted to get your opinion on uh, Alan Lazard this year. I know we really put him off because he had such a down year, but people are really quick to forget the years he had with Aaron Rodgers. Now, with Rodgers coming back and him having a good quarterback, what do you think could happen? I think he could really have a productive year. I don't think he's going to put up numbers like he did in Green Bay, but I think people ought to stop writing him off like he's, a terrible wide receiver. I think one bad year does not define his um, his potential on this roster. Thanks, buddy. And as always, go Jets. God bless. Thank you, man. So Alan Lazard was brought in a year ago after coming off a 60 catch, 788 yards, six touchdown season in Green Bay. Year prior, 40 catches, 513 yards, eight touchdowns. Uh, obviously had success with Rodgers, and the hope was that he'd be playing with Rodgers again. Without Rodgers, 23 catches, 311 yards, one receiving touchdown. And there's so many mouths to feed in this offense. I don't know if he's going to have 311 receiving yards, but there's a chance that he could give like similar production to what he had a year ago, but with a better result. And what I mean by that is, he was essentially relied on to be the Jets' number two receiver and was horrible. If in a much more limited sample as the team's like fourth wide receiver with uh, also including Tyler Conklin and Jeremy Ruckert and Brees Hall and Braylon Allen in the passing attack. Like Again, I want to emphasize, outside of Garrett Wilson, who I think is going to be a target hog, I think Brees is going to be right there in receptions as well as, you know, number two. From like third to sixth or seventh on this team, I think you're going to see a big clump of guys together. And if he's just functional, I think that's a win for the Jets. He's going to be overpaid no matter what he produces this year. Um, You can get out of the contract after this season. But the Jets need Alan Lazard to just be a functional, like, fourth wide receiver. If he can do that, you sign up for it, you take it. But Lazard's been frustrating. Uh, Even this summer, it feels like he's had practices where he's looked great, catching touchdown passes, and then, you know, really bad drops. So I have no idea what it's going to end up looking like at the end of the year stat line. But I'm semi-optimistic, I guess, that he could, again, be just a functioning wide receiver because he was literally unplayable last year. It was that bad. Let's go to Neil up next in Jersey City who wants to talk the uh, 49ers matchup. All right, let's do it. Hey, what's up, Matt? This is Neil from Jersey City, New Jersey. What's up, Neil? Uh, A couple quick things I want to mention before I get into my question. Uh, One, I really enjoy listening to your podcast. I've been listening for a couple years now. Uh, Thank you. I just really enjoy the content, so thanks so much for putting – uh, all the great things out there that you do. Um, the other fun fact uh, I have for you actually is that I live in the same building as Mike Williams. Oh, in no way. City here, and I can tell why this guy's been so dominant on the field uh, when he has been on the field over the last several years. I'm um, really looking forward to seeing what he can do in this Jets offense. Uh, my question for you, uh, kind of a couple things, right? So want to get into the fact that Brandon Ayuk and Trent Williams – you know, they're holding out as well, uh, looking for new contracts. Um, you know, obviously we know all the stuff about Hassan Reddick. Um, curious if you think that Ayuk and Williams will play for the Niners in week one, what implications that might have uh, in this game. And then uh, secondly, who do you think that the Jets defense needs to either neutralize or slow down the most? Uh, obviously McCaffrey comes to mind um, being probably the best player, but, you know, the Jets historically don't do well against guarding tight ends. I'm curious what implications that has with Kittle, you know, the Debo, excuse me, Debo, Ayuk, if he plays, et cetera. Um, thanks so much, and go Jets. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, for So we know 
obviously now after the fact that call was um, before Ayuk signs and before Williams is back and suddenly things look a little bit different now for the 49ers, right? Like they're going to have two of their guys. Williams, I think is going to play uh, at left tackle. We had some spin zone, try to spin zone yesterday. Um, but he's 35 and he's going to, you know, didn't have any training camp. He's going to be rusty. He's one of the, he's the best left tackle in the sport and is going to cakewalk to the hall of fame. He's a special, special human being. I think he could show up to, if there was a game today, I think he could show up and play left tackle at a high level. That's just, he's a unique, unique guy. So I don't, I, I don't think there's going to be much rust there. Ayuk is going to be a part of that um, that offense and be a very difficult guy. I would think Sauce Gardner has to shadow Ayuk. I mean, Debo, what he is at this point in his career, and I think you could take him out of the game. But to, to look at the McCaffrey is going to be tough. And for me, the guy that I'm at, my answer might surprise you. I might go George Kittle. Because the Jets have shown at times a lot of struggles against tight ends. Um, the game against Cleveland last year with David Njoku really stands out to me um, as as just a, a major red flag. So I'm thinking he's going to be Kittle's going to end up being my answer because I like Quincy Williams' chances of stopping uh, McCaffrey or containing him a little bit. But get, getting Ayuk and Williams back is huge for them. And the Jets are still without their holdout in Hassan Reddick, which is not great. I don't think Hassan Reddick's going to play. If you ask me this right now, I don't think he's going to play. Thanks for the kind words. Le- love to see that Mike Williams is, uh, you can see why he's so dominant. I'm, I'm excited to see Mike Williams this year. It might take him a little bit to get healthy, but I'm excited to see it. Let's go to this next caller actually doesn't have a name, but I absolutely love this call. We had to play it. So here we go. May you sign. May you tell the New York Jets to sign Jason Brownlee back. He was a rookie star for the New York Jets, and we want him back. Mississippi. <laughs> I, I absolutely love it. I love the, the Jason Brownlee love. So good news. He is back with the New York Jets practice squad. Uh, very happy about that. Now, Jason Brownlee is from West Point, Mississippi. He went to West Point High, uh, uh, West Point uh, High School, East Mississippi Community College in 2018 and 2019, and then Southern Miss from 2020 to 2022. Um, I thought he had an up and down training camp, but I like Brownlee. I think there's some upside there, and I'm glad that he's back on the practice squad. Love that. Uh, maybe he gets a call up at at some point during the regular season, but we'll keep our we'll keep our eye on Jason Brownlee and we'll look for some Brownlee updates. All right, Travis from Ohio's next. He wants to do fifty three man roster and just state of the team. Hey Matt, what's up, Travis from Ohio? Hey buddy, um, I didn't call in last week because there wasn't anything going on until late. Drop there, 53, man. And for me, I know I called in before the draft and said that 45 spots were taken. And then after the draft, I thought 49 more after we trade. It would have been 50, but we traded JFM. But um, anywho, the no real sur- surprises. All my guys kind of made it except Cunts. Yeah, but he kind of did because he's on the practice squad. I thought he was going to be better this year, but dude sucks. Maybe hit the jugs machine kid, whatever. Um, two more effort for Raz score. But um, I had Jordan Travis making it, Yubella, and Foto, and they made it, but they're all on the IR. And I had Brownlee making it, but he did initially and got cut, so I guess I'm wrong there. But um, no real surprises. I, I I knew I called in before the draft and said that we can't really supplement the team with a whole lot of guys because there's, like I said, with 45 spots, 
and 53 available. Not much room, but they did well. I mean, adding Foe 2 and uh, Corley and um, <laughs> both running backs. <laughs> like, I had them making it in the 49, but it was oh. the undrafted guys that I love seeing the effort out of. And honestly, I, I think I called in two weeks ago and said that I would have liked to see Brandon Smith make it over Brownlee. And looks like there's a shot now because we got Smith on the practice squad. So I don't, I'm not hating on Brownlee. It's just like he's a bottom roster dude, you know. And it's kind of like in year two, you know what you got with him. Uh, with Brandon Smith, at least he flashed in preseason on those awesome catches, deep catches too. So anywho. Love you, brother. Hope uh, the transition move is going well. And, Thank you. And, uh, go Jets. Bye. Yeah, move move is we're we're settling in over here, which is good. I'm excited about. Yeah, I'm. I I, I like what you went through there with uh, Brandon Smith and Brownlee. I think there was some debate whether um, Brownlee or not would would make the team. He ends up not or initially making it, and then. Uh, losing his spot for an extra tight end, which kind of makes sense why they went that route. They weren't going to carry to, uh, he makes it through, through to the practice squad. I like him kind of just talked about him in the last call as well. I'm looking for, um, some upside there. I don't know why they brought back Zach Coons to the practice squad. I'm kind of over that experiment. I don't think he's looked very good at all, uh, in the preseason or in training camp drops the issue wrong routes, very good athleticism. And Joe Douglas has shown in the past that he likes to bet on athleticism and sometimes it takes a little while. So maybe they're holding out hope that he you know, can stick and, and develop on the practice squad this year. But I, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really, really tough for, for that. Let's do PG up next, who has some thoughts on Joe Douglas and talking contracts. Hello, Matt O'Leary, PG from Long Island here. How's it going? A couple things. Uh, one, I saw your clips of uh, Joe Douglas on, on uh, YouTube during the week. And in my opinion, you, you kind of missed the major one. Um, when he said that, you know, he does not have the luxury of dealing with one player and one agent. Uh, he has 53 other guys in the locker room he has to answer to. And I think that's, that's really the case. I mean, you know, he... He needs to set a precedent. He can't, you know, uh, cave in to, to uh, his demands. You know, there's no crime in baseball. There's no caving as a Jets GM. So it's really up to Reddick to show up, whether they sweep the deal or not, on his contract, and fall out and, and get that bag of money next year, whether it's with the Jets, probably not, but with some other team. Really his only choice. Uh, second thing is talking about the unknown coach that said that, you know, uh, that Rogers is washed up. Wouldn't it be funny if that was actually Robert Salad? <laughs> and he, <laughs> he just said it knowing he's never going to get uh, outed on it. Um, and he's just using it as a way to, you know, put a chip, a bigger chip on Rogers' shoulders. We all know Rogers plays better when he's got a chip on his shoulder. So, uh, what if that was Robert Sala? That would be great. Of course, I doubt it was. Um, but anyway, the other thing is, speaking of Robert Sala, I think this opening game Monday night in San Francisco is a litmus test. We've talked about how the Jets have under Sala's, you know, tenure not showed up for big games. So it would be very interesting how they come out. And then do they get out coached? you got Shanahan over there, great great coach and staff that got literally months to prepare, prepare on each side. So interested to see that they get out schemed. Um, obviously a blowout in either direction. Really, game one doesn't matter. But I do think it's a big litmus test for Robert Sala to see where he is as a coach, where the Jets are as a team. Anyway, uh, love to get your thoughts on that, Matt O'Leary. And as always, week one, go Jets. 
We made it to week one, baby. Thank you, PG, as always, for the call there. I love the point bringing up uh, with Robert Sala and the big games. It's something that we've talked about before, but a few examples that jump out to me over the years. Uh, Miami last year and the year before that in Seattle, games where the Jets were still technically alive and got the crap kicked out of them. Doors blown off. It's not that's not acceptable. It's not. Now, again, there's going to be the built-in excuse with the quarterback, but there's there's no, that excuse isn't there anymore. Excuse is no longer there. It is a big litmus test uh because Kyle Shanahan is a good coach. He gets a lot of flack because he hasn't been able to win a Super Bowl yet. He's he's gotten there a couple times and the, but they're just always a really good team gotten a ton out of the roster a ton out of their uh limited quarterbacks and maybe that's not fair to purdy I, I, purdy might get a little bit too much hate i think he's in the good tier i wouldn't say brock purdy's elite or a top five but i think he's he, he's a pretty good quarterback in this league um but he makes life so easy for the 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 young quarterback and um i think he is a really really good coach and if salah doesn't look good and this team doesn't look good and they get blown out and in front of a ton of eyeballs well they better look good against tennessee on sunday otherwise things could get real ugly real quick i'll tell you that one and for douglas i hope he's right i hope he's right holding firm uh he's 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 betting he's betting on the the other 52 guys on this roster and I guess my question would be, why did he trade for him or look for Jadavion Clowney to come in or uh, want a potential meeting with Shaq Barrett if he was comfortable with this edge room and the defensive line, as is. So I hope he's right. But I don't think in his heart of hearts he believes that. Let's do Peter from the beautiful Hudson Valley. Hey, man. It's Peter from up in the beautiful, starting to feel like fall football weather. Oh, Hudson yeah. Valley. Calling in a little late on Tuesday. I almost forgot that I hadn't uh, left you a message already. So, um, seeing the final roster now, seeing the practice squad, seeing the situation with this on Reddick now that we know the 49ers have Williams and Ayuk back under contract. Brian going to this game Monday with the best, you know, 70 players total possible. And. I'm just thinking about this Jets roster versus all the Jets rosters that, you know, I've seen over the past nearly 45 years as a Jets fan. And I feel this is the best constructed, you know, roster overall, especially with Rodgers at quarterback, because the, the previous one for me would have been 98 with Vinny Testaverde, uh, when the Jets went 12 and 4 and won the division. So I'm obviously very optimistic and I remain hopeful, but my question is this. Do you think, based on all the stuff you and others have talked about between the off season and now, on the, on the precipice of starting this year, bringing back Huff, trading away JFM, extending like Michael Carter, freeing up money some other way, like you know having someone be a different play caller on offense, have the Jets done everything possible to make this team pretty much a lock, not only to make the playoffs but win one or two games and make some noise? If there's anything else you think they could have done or should have done, that's basically my question at this point. And as always, go Jets. Yeah, man, it's just always a uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to just jump right into it. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think this this is a really good, really, really good roster. I'm very excited for this year. I think they're going to be a playoff team. I think they're going to win a playoff game too, maybe more. We'll, do, we'll see in my predictions tomorrow. Can they be a Super Bowl team? I think they're really close. <laughs> it's going to go back to Hassan Reddick. I'm sorry. I don't want to keep bringing it up, but it's a huge story when a gigantic acquisition via trade happens and he's not here yet. I think eventually he will be. I'm going to guess that he does report and will eventually play for the Jets. They, they need that guy to be great. And that puts them over the top. So not my my what they could have done. It's not 100% their fault. That's not what I'm saying. But they could have got their elite pass rusher in the building. And maybe that's unfair for me to say. But I don't think it, I don't think it is. 
that's that's the last thing because if they don't then you're relying on Michael Clemens to be JFM which I don't think he is I think he's a poor man's version of him or Tack McKinley to hit his groove or you know the UDFAs I like all three of the UDFAs I really do but it's asking a lot out of those guys when you have Super Bowl aspirations and when you're a team putting all your chips to the table and going for it I want to be all the way in, not the one foot in, one foot out. And they're almost all the way in. They're like really close to being all the way in, but not quite. Let's close with Jerry from Brooklyn. Hi, I'm Jerry calling from Brooklyn. I have an idea that's not going to sit well with me if it comes to pass. All right, let's hear it. Let's say Hassan Reddick shows up finally. And he plays one down, gets injured, and sits out the rest of the season. Are the Jets responsible to pay him his entire salary for this year and therefore lose him to free agency next year? I don't know. They would. I don't like the way I'm thinking, but I'm suspicious like that. Jerry, I understand your fear uh, with a guy who's holding out, getting hurt, and what that would mean for the team. Yeah, they would. They would if he plays. That's essentially it. Like he's he's got a he's got to play for you to accrue that year. If he sits out the year, it doesn't accrue. So he would be right if he sits out for the whole year. He's right back to where he started uh, with the Jets on the same deal. So I don't know what the end plan is here. But yeah, they they would lose him for just a couple of plays. Same thing if like, God forbid, Aaron Rodgers was on the last year of his deal and was a free agent after last year with when all that happened. So that's the risk that you run. That's for one on the Jet side of things, but two on Reddick for you know holding out this long and he runs the risk of injury. It worked out for the Chiefs and Chris Jones after he missed the game and then came back and they won a Super Bowl and he was really good. It doesn't always work that way. It's scary. It's something that's on the mind as the New York Jets head into their very highly anticipated 2024 season. Guys, that's going to do it for me in this episode. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you get the show. Like, comment, leave a review, all that. I'm Matt O'Leary, and I'll catch you next time.